Good morning, and welcome to Morning Movie News, where fascinatingly, not just one, but two movie battle royales are brewing. And in both cases, the movies are very well matched to the point that I don't know which one is going to win, but I do know that it's going to be interesting. And I'll be very curious to hear down below which movie in each battle you'd put your money on, at least at this point. I think the, the situation will be in constant flux because again, they're both so well matched. All right, so the first is in the specialty awards sector. The other is in the blockbuster trailer arena, and we'll get to that momentarily. But I want to start out with the Gotham Awards, uh, where two movies uh, emerged as frontrunners last night. The Gotham Awards are very important. They're like the first big awards show during awards season. There are stages to awards season. The first is like the film festivals, where you start to see, um, you know, the the, the frontrunner, the, the the larger pack of frontrunners emerge, right? Then you call those front runners during this stage, which is like low-key awards shows like the Gotham Awards and also like critics associations across the country releasing their best of the year lists. And some of them even will name their own thoughts on best picture, best director, best actor, etc. Um, and Gotham Awards, by the way, I want to point out is an independent uh, awards show only for independent film. So a couple of movies weren't even in contention. So you have to keep that in mind. But still, last year, they were able to predict some of the people who walked away with Oscars in late February. Oh boy, it's a long awards season. Uh, but Moonlight won a number of awards last year uh, at the Gotham Awards, but it also won Best Picture, which it ultimately walked away with. That was very down to the wire, as I'm sure you recall. And then Casey Affleck won uh, Best Actor at the Gotham Awards, and he ultimately walked away with that Oscar as well, which was also controversial, interestingly enough. I don't think this year will be quite as controversial because last year, the two movies that emerged as the front runners, as you can see, are Get Out and Call Me By Your Name. And I think everybody likes both those movies. Um, I mean, once you see them, you will. Call Me By Your Name, of course, has just come out. But with Moonlight versus La La Land, it was really like whatever whatever side you picked, you were like, the other side is trash. <laughs> but I, I think in this case, I, well, actually, let's talk about how it broke down. I think the Gotham Awards did a really good job um, accurately rewarding both films. So Get Out won the most awards. Get Out won Best Director and Best uh, Breakthrough Director, the Audience Award for Best Picture, and also Best Screenplay. Big night for Jordan Peele. But the most uh, the most important award, Best Picture, remained elusive. And speaking of Jordan Peele, you know, we just recently talked about that, that thing where uh, Universal submitted Get Out and was accepted as a comedy musical for the Golden Globes. And those nominations, by the way, come out December 11th. And Jordan Peele was like, yeah, I agree with everybody else that that's ridiculous. Well, I wonder how he feels now after going head to head with Call Me By Your Name for Best Picture at the Gotham Awards and losing because Call Me By Your Name took home that prize. It also took home a breakthrough actor for Timothy Chalamet. And I just posted my review of Call Me By Your Name and that movie should not be dismissed or, or underestimated. It is not only an extremely well-made film, but it is the finest Oscar bait. As I said in my review, the best Oscar bait I've seen since The King's Speech. It's, it's, a, it's a major contender and is designed to be so. Uh, I actually think that Get Out is not as good a film as Call Me By Your Name, filmmaking wise, but Get Out is so important because I think of how it captures this the moment we are, we're, we're in, in society perfectly. It was a real lightning rod film. It really pushed a lot of boundaries. And I think so. I, I think that the Gotham Awards, in my opinion, got it right. Uh, but I'm sure, you know, Get Out still is really, really wants that uh, Best Picture Award, which is why it, it put itself in that category for the Golden Globes. And that's another question. Do you feel a little better about that categorization now that you've seen it lose to Call Me By Your Name at the Gotham Awards? All right, so some of the other big awards that were handed out last night. James Franco took home Best Actor for The Disaster Artist. I'm seeing that tonight. My review will go up tomorrow. Uh, but he, of course, wants that Oscar win as well. And Searshi Ronan took home Best Actress for Lady Bird. And as part of her awards campaign, she's hosting Saturday Night Live this Saturday. James Franco actually is slated to host as well in a couple of weeks. Uh, I'm very excited to see both of their shows. Saturday Night Live is really uh, hit or miss, uh, but when it's it's had some particularly good uh, shows this season, so I'm excited for both of them. Uh, but yes, Get Out and Call Me By Your Name are definitely starting to break away from the pack. They're not so far out there that it's it's done. The race isn't done yet, uh, but this is certainly it, we're certainly starting to see it take shape. And any other film better get on the board, or they they will pull away to the point that they're too far ahead of everybody else. But I think it's very exciting. 
And again, I agree with how the Gotham Awards uh, handed out those distinctions. Uh, as I said in my uh, review of Call Me By Your Name, it's rare for anybody to sweep at the Oscars because they try to be very democratic about rewarding films. So I wonder if either of those films would be so fortunate to sweep uh, with the big awards shows. Fascinating. All right, so that's the first uh, battle royale. Now, the second is that uh, this Thursday, we're going to have a major trailer battle between Avengers Infinity War and Jurassic World 2, a.k.a. Fallen Kingdom. And Prabhangad uh, tweeted me this morning and said, well, which this is a major uh, contest, Grace. Which do you think will win the 24-hour view count? And that's, that's a big deal. That's, of course, uh, how many views you, you rack up in the first 24 hours. And there's a list going at this point, right? It's it, it um, you know, the recent film that came out, the Stephen King adaptation. It's always so hard because, you, you know, it's uh, such a common word. Uh, but um, try doing metadata for that movie, boy. It is difficult. Uh, but anyway, that's still the top viewed trailer in the first 24 hours. And so, you know, you might think, well, easy. Avengers Infinity War, but not so fast, because don't forget the Jurassic World unseated the Avengers in terms of box office debuts, you know, just getting a smidge past it. Uh, you know, there are only three movies that have ever opened over 200 million, Star Wars The Force Awakens, Jurassic World, and The Avengers, in that order. Uh, so we'll see if the trailers are in that order as well. It's pretty gutsy of Universal. They probably are like, yeah, we unseated Avengers in terms of opening weekends, let's take them on with trailers. And I do think there is enough space for both of them, because I think that Avengers Infinity world will debut you know there's a three the russo brothers put out a three so it's either thursday three days from when they tweeted that or december 3rd um if it's thursday it will probably be in the morning like a good morning america so it'll play all day and then the jurassic world falling kingdom trailer doesn't debut until the evening during the nbc football game it's interesting speaking of football to see universal uh, borrow from the playbook of disney another media empire and use one part of you know, their empire to promote another. I think it's two things, actually. Side note, I think that when they play a trailer for a big movie on one of their sport sporting events, you know, Disney so often debuts trailers during ESPN, like Jimmy Kimmel, you know, their ABC late night talk show. Uh, I think it's on the one hand to boost that, that, that show or that brand and be like, hey, everybody, look at this. But I also think it's to capture that audience, particularly with sporting events, because of course, everybody who's already into Avengers Infinity War will find the trailer no matter where it debuts. But for everybody watching football Thursday night, they'll be like, oh yeah, Jurassic World 2 is coming out. Maybe I will see that. Because if you want to make a lot of money at the box office, you got to get that movie goer that hardly ever goes to the movies. But watch a sports. Uh, for free on NBC, <laughs> right? So, uh, but, but anyway, with Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom's trailer debuting in the evening, it'll most likely get most of its play Friday in the morning. And you know, it'll do really well overnight overseas because of the time difference. But then when America wakes up, uh, they'll look at the internet and they'll say, what's happening? Jurassic World 2 trailer, don't mind if I do. And they'll go watch that. So there is space for both of them to coexist. Who will win the 24-hour view count? I honestly don't know. I think it depends on the trailers themselves, which is better and also which is meatier. I think the uh, I think Infinity War will be like a full trailer because they already, of course, debuted so much footage at D23 and Comic-Con and it's leaked. I haven't watched any of it. I want to be fresh going in with you guys. Um, but Jurassic World could just be a tease. It could just be like a really short tease. And therefore, it's not really a competition in, in that case. So I'm excited to watch both. Now, the other, uh, the other wrinkle to this story is that why are these trailers debuting so early? They're supposed to play in front of Star Wars, but that doesn't come out until December 15th. This is two weeks early. Now, it makes sense for Infinity War because nothing's happening this week. Why not take advantage of the dead space, right? So they had the big fluff piece pat on the back thing in Vanity Fair on Monday, debut the trailer on Thursday. They get the whole week to themselves. And when you think of that, it's very but nicely constructed. It is, again, very gutsy of Universal to muscle in there and say, I want to be in here too. But why would they do that? Why wouldn't Jurassic World 2 just take the next week, where there are also no wide releases prior to Star Wars? Why not make that Jurassic World week? Well, there's two things. First is that Star Wars actually starts hitting countries December 13th, which is a Wednesday, which means their late night shows are on Tuesday, December 12th. So really, you'd have to get your trailer out Monday morning, but then it's, it's going to cut down chatter time because everyone's going to start talking about Star Wars because with the time difference, basically on Tuesday. Star Wars also, by the way, premieres December 9th. You know, that has the big um, Hollywood premiere. So now you have like a spoiler gauge uh, as well to think about. Uh, so you would really want to debut the trailers the week before in that case. Uh, you know, and then it makes sense that Infinity War would have taken the week you know, prior to that because they can have it all to themselves. Uh, 
But the rumor is that Han Solo is going to have a teaser also to play in front of Jurassic World. I mean, in front of uh, Last Jedi. So that's going to take the week before Star Wars. So Jurassic World doesn't want to compete with that. Uh, and I think, that's, I think that's a very reasonable rumor because Han Solo really needs to change the conversation at this point away from all the behind-the-scenes drama to the movie itself. Although methinks, I still think Alden Ehrenreich is horribly miscast as uh, Han Solo because he's not, he's, he's very talented, but he's not Harrison Ford. Uh, so I hope that they get good chatter when they debut that teaser. So a very, very interesting situation, a lot of stuff going on there. So it's a light news day, so I picked two viewer questions to fill out the rest of the episode. So the first comes from Mrs. Soron, great name. So Mrs. Soron says, question, are you planning to review Godless, the new Netflix Western Grace? I tweeted about it over the holiday. I've only watched two episodes. It's good, some of the best cinematography I've ever seen on a television show, but it's slow. Uh, but Mrs. Soron says, I see it's gotten quite good reviews, but Dazed and Confused magazine accused it of being faux feminist for trying to capitalize on, a, on superficial ideas about strong women and feminism without really doing anything for women or female representation on screen. There are a couple of other reviews that are a bit more ambivalent as well. Seems like the show has been rather misleading in its advertising, causing some to be quite disappointed. I'd like to hear your thoughts. Great question. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with um, Godless, it's a new miniseries that just debuted on Netflix, which again, they did nothing to promote. And it's from writer-director Scott Frank, uh, and it's uh, executive produced by Steven Soderbergh. And the hook is, is that it takes place in a town of all women because an accident, a mining accident, killed all the working age men like a few years ago. So there are some guys in town, for the mo but for the most part, it's all women. It's pretty much like Why the Last Man, a great comic book that if you're not familiar with it, you should be. And actually, FX is doing that as a television show. It's going to be amazing. Uh, and they are not going to drop the ball because Brian K. Vaughan, you know, for years, wrote a comic book exploring the situation. But Scott Frank didn't rip off Why the Last Man. He got a really good hook finding out that this actually did happen in the Old West. There were accidents, and sometimes the women would stay on, and sometimes they would, they would move on. But all the men would be gone in just a matter of minutes. Very, very interesting. Uh, and so they use that to promote the show. But the problem, so there, but there are some problems. And so, and like for instance, in the um, the first episode, someone did a tally and said, you know, for a show that's supposed to represent a town of all women, most of the dialogue, I think it was like 76% of the dialogue is spoken by men. That's a really bad, that's a really bad, um, you know, piece to run about your show if, if you've been promoting it as like a show about women. So I think the problem is, is that Scott Frank came across a really good hook, good for him, but he didn't have the ability to execute it. Uh, and also he didn't have the foresight to realize how much he would step in it with particularly today's social media. So Scott Frank, when he started out his career, he did do some stuff with female characters. Little Man Tate was one of his first screenplays, so, so it was Dead Again. But in both cases, you had Jodie Foster involved and Emma Thompson involved, and they're very strong female creatives. And I'm sure they were able to fix and um, counter any deficiencies in Scott Frank's work when it came to female characters. But ever since then, Scott Frank, not big on female characters. And I think that's something maybe he should have been more aware of, or somebody should have pointed out to him and done him that favor. Now, I'm not saying that Scott Frank, when he came up with the hook, should have been like, well, I guess I can't do this because I'm not so good with female characters. I think that he should have said, um, oh, by the way, on a side note, you might be like, well, who's talking if it's a town full of women? Uh, there's a guy on the run. There are a couple guys left, like the sheriff is left, and there's and there's a guy on the run, uh, and the outlaw who's after him, and they come upon the town, and they those three guys do most of the talking, unfortunately. And also Sam uh, uh, Waterston, Catherine Waterston's father from Law and Order, as a marshal, so they do almost all the talking, and, and and someone from the mining company. A lot of guys come to town, all right, basically, and and talk a lot. Uh, so, so anyway, I think Scott Frank should have had a woman writer come on board or a male writer who's good with female characters and help him out. Not even necessarily as a partner, just someone to help with the outline, to come up with some of the, um, to help develop the characters, and just to be an outside viewpoint so that he didn't make such a big mistake. Uh, also, Michelle Dockery from Downton Abbey, a lot of British people uh, in this Western, very good. She's excellent on the show. And they did a nice job creating a Clint Eastwood type of character for her, but that means she's the silent type, so she doesn't have a lot of dialogue. But it's even more than that. Uh, she's really viewed only through the eyes of the male characters on the show. And she's also the hottest widow in town, and everybody wants to marry, marry her. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's a little bit of a tired stereotype. Uh, but I think the problem is that that's the only way that you usually ever see the character. They're 
are no scenes where it's just like, what's Michelle Dockery up today? It's always in the context of these guys who are potential romantic interests for her. And that's where the problem stems from. And I think that Scott Frank, you know, who usually writes male-centric pieces, that's, you know, that's the norm. And it's often the norm in male-centric pieces. But if you're going to have a hook, if this is going to be your hook, you got to have some scenes with Michelle Dockery where she's just doing Michelle Dockery type stuff. And I think somebody else would have been able to point that out to him. Uh, so if you're going to have a hook, the lesson here for anybody else is if you find a really good hook, make sure that you can deliver on it, both creatively and in terms of audience expectations. And if you can't, again, it doesn't mean you have to walk away from it, but enlist someone to help you who can, who can make sure that you do. All right, so that's the first viewer question. The second is from Marie Katie, and Marie Katie says, Question, Grace. I love this question. Do you think there is a chance that if any song from Coco gets nominated for an Oscar, it would be the version in Spanish? I ask because I've heard both versions, and honestly, the ones in Spanish are simply better and filled with even more emotion. I love your videos, and I never miss one. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Squeak, squeak, as in the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Thank you for asking, Marie. I had a wonderful Thanksgiving, and I hope you did as well. And I love your question because when i reviewed coco i was like fabulous movie but you know what the music ain't that special i mean it's atmospheric it's pleasant but it's nothing to write home about and the lopez's of course did the, the frozen music so it was unfortunate they couldn't deliver again but interestingly a number of you in the comments who had seen the spanish language version which of course is playing in spanish-speaking countries and also in a couple theaters here in the united states said but well grace i have to tell you the spanish language versions of the songs are amazing and so that really piqued my interest and then when i saw marie Katie's question, I had like a eureka moment where I was like, man, even though no matter what language the dialogue is in, because because Coco takes place in Mexico, perhaps Pixar should have kept the, the songs of Spanish language in every version of the film. And I think that would have helped them even with their Oscar campaign, because I think it would have made the film feel even more authentic. And that, you know, or, and maybe even a mix, because people might be like, well, people don't know what the song is about then. Okay, we'll have a mix of Spanish and English lyrics. And this begs the question that as film becomes, well, all entertainment becomes more global, you have less and less of an idea of the language that's being spoken by the person watching your content, right? It plays, again, globally. So maybe there should be more of a blurring of language in entertainment. TV's doing it. For instance, in Godless, which we just discussed, Michelle Dockery's mother-in-law is Native American, and they speak... Um, her language together. And I think it really gives a nice feel to the show and again, feels more realistic. Like, you know, back in the old days of Hollywood, you know, when they wanted to indicate that someone was speaking another language or was from a different region, they would speak in an accent. They'd be like, imagine we're speaking in the language of this accent. And you know, those, those were the times. But now, and also again, content wasn't quite, it didn't have the same global audience that it does today. But now, I think with, with uh, digital, you know, certainly making things uh, go out there, I think that maybe they should have more um, again, blurring of the language lines. And a great example of that, two examples come from Mel Gibson, uh, Passion of the Christ, which was in Latin, and Apocalypto, which was in Mayan. And both films, I think, were better for it. And both were very well received and did very well financially. Passion of the Christ did incredibly well financially. So I think this is an interesting idea, and I'm curious to how you guys feel about it. Of course, it's too late for Pixar to do this with Coco, but if you could go back in time, would you advise Pixar to release the film, no matter what language the dialogue was in, with Spanish language songs? Uh, all right, write your thoughts uh, down below. That's today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Soron and Marie Katie, for your questions. Uh, write down your thoughts on that, the two stories, anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow, and of course, any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching.